I should. <laughs> and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, those of you online. Welcome to Sorry Online that you missed the nachos tonight. It was pretty good eating. And uh, the fellowship was uh, good, too. I, I forgot to get a picture. I usually bring a picture to make the online people jealous that they're not here. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, we enjoy Wednesday nights. And... We'll enjoy, I think, tonight a new series on Jeroboam. How many of you have, uh, when I announced we were going to do Jeroboam, you thought, ah, Jeroboam. Every church I've ever been to, the pastor did a series on Jeroboam. No. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> uh, John, you've been in church, what, 200 years? Have you ever had a... Close to <laughs> Ever had a series on Jeroboam? No. Well, this will be the first, Okay. And uh, I promise we'll be thorough. That's one thing that, uh, I, that uh, we're good at, is uh, being thorough. So let me lead us in a word of prayer. And uh, well, let's see, before I do that, uh, I don't think I have any announcements. I think everything's normal, uh, uh, except I think Greg and Lori Smith will be with us this weekend from Arkansas, passing through. So, uh, uh, and um, John and Ursula, I was trying to think of other announcements. John and Ursula Smedley, they've been fighting the, the, the crud, and uh, so they're, they're still down a little bit. Uh, Sherry, Ron and Sherry. Ron, of course, is recovering from cancer, but uh, Sherry fell. Have you talked to her the last couple of days? Or? She was sore, but feeling better. Sore, but feeling good. Okay, feeling better, right? Yeah. Yeah, we'll keep Sherry in our prayers, too. Yeah. And uh, little Miles is doing well. He's, he's growing up. He's uh, got Hebrew down. We're now working on Greek. Um, <laughs> we're saving algebra until he gets a little bit older. But Hebrew and Greek, that's essential. So um, uh, anyway, all, they're all doing well. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we are most grateful for the opportunity to come in to uh, look at the Word, to study the Word, to fellowship uh, not only uh, here, but across the miles as well. And uh, we're uh, just prayerful that uh, your, your uh, word would be living and active for us, that it uh, would uh, give us some, some insights into uh, part of Scripture that we haven't studied very much, and that uh, that would be an enjoyable experience and helpful as well. In Jesus' name, amen. And we do come in to Jeroboam, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's, he really is one of these, I think, that uh, you're going to love him, you're going to hate him, just depending on uh, which lesson we get into. Tonight, I, I don't know, and looking at what we've looked at tonight, uh, what we're going to look at tonight, uh, I would say, uh, you know, if Jeroboam invited me to lunch, I would accept the invitation. Uh, sounds like a guy I would like to get to know that uh, he might uh, have some hope and some potential. So we'll look at that. I think next week, uh, also will uh, say, well, that's, uh, he's, he's actually even better than I thought he was. You know, before I get into Jeroboam, I've been learning about Harry S. Truman. <laughs> um, and uh, Harry S. Truman, you know, the things I'm learning, of course, you, when you learn from one book, you don't know if it's really uh, all that accurate, but uh, all of a sudden I'm like, well, I kind of like Harry. Uh, and uh, the things I learn about him. And uh, so Jeroboam's that way too. But before it's done, we might not like Jeroboam as much as we like Harry. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, kind of, uh, we'll kind of see how it is uh, with uh, Jeroboam. Here's his picture, by the way. This is Jeroboam right here uh, from a future event. We uh, aren't this... I, I, I should have found a... And in fact, I found one picture of him when he was young. Um, I'll, but I'll show it next week because it really uh, uh, goes to uh, next week's scripture. Here's Jeroboam uh, when he's uh, a part of the idolatry worship uh, and uh, setting up all the, uh, the idols there. So that is yet to come. But uh, we are going to uh, look tonight at 1 Kings chapter 11. But I want us to begin by understanding the times a little bit that Jeroboam is in, in 1 Kings chapter 11, and uh, let's go through verses 1 through 13, and then we'll, uh, then we'll pick and choose a little bit, uh, but um, 
uh, from what we're going to go through. But I want us to look at these uh, verses and see. Uh, so it's uh, the days of King Solomon. You remember him, of course, Saul, then David, then Solomon, uh, David's son. So King Solomon loved many strange women. Now, I've known some men who loved some strange women too, but uh, this is uh, by strange here, this means foreign. He loved many foreign women. This is what's, what's kind of interesting here in setting the scene for Jeroboam is that Solomon, up to this point, really everything you read about Solomon has been good. I mean, he's a jolly good fella. He loved the Lord. He uh, built the temple. He dedicated the temple. We haven't really seen anything bad about Solomon at all. Now we get to chapter 11, 1 Kings chapter 11, and it starts with the word, but. And we have this sort of, ah, there's another side of the story that you need to know about King Solomon as well. And that is, he loved strange women. That is, uh, foreign women. Uh, and uh, let me uh, see, I'm going to increase the size of that just a little bit. There we go. Uh, he loved uh, many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, that uh, She's going to come into play here in just a little bit. The daughter of Pharaoh probably was the strange woman he loved the most, okay? The foreign, the foreign woman he loved the most. Uh, and so she's mentioned on a number of occasions. But then also women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, the Hittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Now, you know, we're, we're going to get in, in just a moment about how many of these strange women there were. Uh, and we're, we're going to have to end up saying to some degree, these were political alliances, and we understand how these political alliances worked in the, in the ancient days that uh, you would kind of give your daughter or a princess to the other king, and uh, that would uh, uh, be an alliance to sort of keep you from, from attacking them. You know, uh, th th I'm not going to attack them because my daughter lives there. And that was sort of the, the way it worked. And that went on. Actually, it was not just ancient days. I mean, you wonder, you know, with the... Uh, the king of uh, Spain and the king of England and the kings of France and of uh, all those uh, European uh, kingdoms. They used to swap children all the time uh, amongst them in order to try to keep some kind of a balance thing going. So there's a sense in which we could say, okay, this is just all politics. But even if we just say it's all politics, there are two things that we uh, would have to say against it. One is there in verse, uh, verse 2, where uh, it says, Ye shall not go into them, these nations, neither shall they come unto you. Okay, that is that which the Lord said. Well, it's, here it's quoting from Exodus chapter, uh, chapter something or another. And it's uh, in there on your notes somewhere. I just can't find it. Uh, 20, did you say 24, 16? 34, 16. Okay, I still don't see it there, but I, I wrote it, so I know it's there. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> Exodus 34, 16, and this is a quote. So in the, in the Torah that, of course, Solomon uh, professed to follow, it has this clear word, national word, really, that because you rely upon the Lord, you don't rely upon the other nations. You don't need the alliances with the other nations like the other nations might need the alliance with other nations. And so, so maybe it's all pol political. Well, even if it's all political, that's not the kind of politics the nation of Israel is supposed to do. The people of God aren't uh, supposed to have those alliances. So there's problem number one. The second problem with saying it's all political is that it does tell us at least uh, twice here, uh, once in verse 1, where it says Solomon loved many strange women. But that one, maybe you could overlook and say, well, that's just a figure of speech, you know, like I love pizza and chocolate cake and all those kind of things. Uh, but then you get down to verse 2, at the end of verse 2 again, Solomon clave unto these women in love. 
So I don't know how you love all these women, but uh, I'm going to take Scripture's word for it. He loved all these women. That was his thing. Uh, and uh, it, um, uh, you know, there was obviously a, uh, not only a physical, but an emotional uh, attachment that he had towards these women. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. That's just a lot of women to love. <laughs> it's a lot of wives, uh, wives, concubines. The, the, the wives, I, I, I think the difference between a wife and a concubine, we talked about this with uh, uh, Hagar and Sarah and Keturah, the wife after Sarah died. Uh, the difference really is legal. Uh, based upon a legal standing. What are you going to get uh, out of this? And the concubine's not going to get near as much as the wife is. Um, and the wives, I think, become princesses. Uh, and so there he's got all of these. I don't even know how you remember their names uh, th through all that. Uh, but nonetheless, there's, that's the political scene we're coming into. And it goes on to say, it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart. Okay, twice it says his wives turned away his heart, his wives turned away his heart. And we happen to remember back up in verse 2 that the warning was, if you go to these other nations, they're going to turn away your heart after their gods. So exactly what the Lord said was going to happen, happened. The wives uh, turned away uh, his heart after other gods. His heart was not perfect with the Lord, as was the heart of his father. So uh, the, the, he's the king. And the kingdom, the, the kingdom that is supposed to be the heart of the work of God on the earth is running out all over the place. It's just sort of messed up. This is the uh, political environment in which Jeroboam is going to enter. Uh, now, verse 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, mentioning some of the pagan gods. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. David, good guy. Solomon starts out a good guy, but he ends up with all these political alliances and all these marriages, and uh, things are uh, going, uh, going bad. In fact, verse 7, Solomon did build a high place, that's an altar, for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, uh, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Because we're not Solomon, we won't uh, dig into those two appearances that he had face to face with the Lord. Uh, but... Uh, the Lord was angry and had and commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore, I'm going to stop right there. That's uh, verse verse uh, ten right there. Now, <clears throat> you've you've got um, all of run after strange god, run after strange women, strange political alliances, end up with strange gods. That's the state of the kingdom. This is the guy who I think by, by this time already had written Proverbs. And Proverbs 5, 20 and 21, the Proverbs uh, you say in verse 1, they were written by King Solomon. So Proverbs chapter 5, verse 20, Solomon says, Why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of the stranger? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Do you want to say, uh, Solomon, go back and read some of your own stuff. <laughs> uh, why would you be ravished with a strange woman like the Pharaoh's daughter and all these other kind of things? Not only that, not only did he write the book of Proverbs, which is really about wisdom, it's about, and, and a lot of it in there is about the, uh, the foolishness of going after the wrong women. Uh, it kind of makes you wonder if this was not a struggle even at that point, but he knew wisdom, and he was writing uh, wisdom uh, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, and later on, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes. When is that? You know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, clearly he's someone who's struggling. He's kind of, 
I don't know, shall we say messed up a little bit, uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, sort of given up on everything, uh, and saying there's no hope and searching for some answers. So Ecclesiastes seems to be a little later, uh, but he also writes the Song of Solomon. Of course, the Song of Solomon is a love song, and, and yet it is a uh, song that most would interpret as God's love for Israel. And so here he's able to write this wonderful, you know, uh, kind of literature. And uh, you, you just take the, the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. That is, the Jews anyway, the Jewish rabbis would consider that to be, as we sometimes call it, the Song of Songs. You can't get a better song than that song. That's the pinnacle of the songs. Uh, that are in there, and, and it's uh, God expressing his love toward uh, Israel and the land of Israel. So he writes Song of Solomon about God's love for Israel. He writes the Proverbs about being faithful uh, and true and not going after all these uh, strange things. He builds the temple. He shows every measure of dedication. There's nothing about the guy that we don't like. And, and then he goes and does this. You're like, how does this happen? How do you make that transition in life? I, he, was, he was king for 40 years, no doubt about it. And maybe, you know, does power go to your head? Does, uh, what, 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 uh, what causes that? I guess the only thing we could say is um, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Somewhere along the way, so Solomon got a uh, chink in the armor. Is that, is that the phrase? Is that what you say? Chink. Solomon got a crack in the foundation. <laughs> Solomon, it, somewhere he changed. Uh, things were uh, different. Someday we'll uh, begin to uh, study that in his own life. But uh, for now, we just want to introduce this as the days of Jeroboam. So let me say that um, what you've got is a kingdom which is both at its zenith and at its worst. Worst, worst, yes. <laughs> uh, so under the days of Solomon, if you look at the map, under King, King Saul and then under King David, it was a pretty small geographic area. But Solomon did, did manage to expand it in its territory, in its influence, really to the point that under Solomon, in those 40 years under Solomon, it would become what I think you would have to call in that day probably the world superpower. It was, the, it, it was stronger than Egypt, it was stronger than Assyria, it was stronger than Babylon, it was uh, strong in wealth, it was strong in, uh, in, in prestige, and especially early on, uh, it was strong in moral conviction, in understanding who it was as a people, but now, at the end, it's lost all that. It has no foundation to it. It's rotten to the core. Um, and uh, yes, I see that look. Hmm. Sounds like another nation. Uh, it, it really does tell us something that uh, when, a la when a nation loses its moral values, as it seems to happen here, and just, you just will accept anything, it's, uh, it's not long with us. Uh, it, uh, there's nothing to hold it together. Uh, and... I think that's what we have. That's certainly, that's the days that Jeroboam came in. And that's going to be important to understand uh, th that, uh, what's the old saying, I, uh, the times make the man or something like that. And uh, Jeroboam is going to step in to really a, uh, uh, a, a perfect storm here, if you will. Uh, and he's going to uh, step up to the plate here a little bit to begin with. Uh, so uh, what we have here, going back to 1 Kings, uh, in, in verse 10, we've already read, so here the Lord's upset with him because he's going after these things he shouldn't have gone after. He kept not that which the Lord commanded. Verse 11, wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done unto thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely, I want you to catch this right here, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and give it to thy servant. Okay, I am going to uh, take the kingdom away. It is not going to be yours. It is uh, going to be done. And I am going to, I was looking for my pen, it's in my pocket. Uh, my pointing pen. Uh, I, I am going to uh, uh, rend the kingdom, rip, 
the kingdom from thee, but, catch this little line right here, and will give it to thy servant, and will give it to thy servant. Okay, we haven't even met his servant yet. And when you're reading 1 Kings, you have no idea. Anywhere prior to this, there's no mention of who this servant is that is going to get the kingdom. So all we know now is because the kingdom is rotten, he's, uh, the, the Lord is going to uh, take it. But there's some qualifications given here, uh, beginning in verse 12. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. For whatever reason, God says... I'm going to honor your dad and not take the kingdom yet. And, of course, dad's dead at this point. But everyone would, would like, I, any political leader certainly would like, a legacy that goes on a few years, right? Uh, and uh, that's always the fear of American politicians is that the next president is going to undo your legacy just like that. And that's not what they want. You know, they want to uh, make it uh, last. So that's probably uh, something the Lord kind of honors that with King David and says, for the sake of David, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to take it away from your son. It'll at least be David's grandson instead of David's son uh, from which it uh, is uh, taken away. So that's, that's uh, qualification number one is he's going to uh, rend the kingdom, give it to thy servant, but qualification number one, not until you're dead. And then qualification number two, howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son David for my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Uh, now, you know, of course, that the 12 tribes altogether were divided, northern kingdom, southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom had how many tribes? 10, and the other one had two. Good math, yes. Uh, had two. The Lord only promised to give him one, uh, and he was going to do it again for David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake. Tells us a little bit about uh, the uh, love of the Lord for uh, the city of Jerusalem. He's chosen Jerusalem. He says, I want that city, I, and, I, and I'm going to keep that city. And so uh, that, you would surmise anyway, that's going to be the tribe of Judah because David was of the tribe of Judah. And uh, Jerusalem was not, Jerusalem is like Washington, D.C. It's, it's not really in a tribe. It's a, it's a no man's land. Uh, but nonetheless, it uh, was in the territory, in the area of Judah. So you would suspect Judah. Now later on, of course, the tribe of Benjamin is going to come into that as well. But at this point, there's only the promise uh, that uh, one out of 12 tribes will go and continue on. So here is uh, the beginning of understanding uh, the times. And we're going to meet Jeroboam in just a moment. And uh, he's going to, uh, uh, to walk into this scene. And then... We, uh, we begin, and it says, The Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was the, of the king's seed in Edom. Uh, okay, the Lord stirred up an adversary. The word adversary. The Hebrew word is Satan. Satan. It's not until the New Testament that we took we, we took the Hebrew word Satan and made it kind of the name of the devil. The devil, the adversary. Satan, as we would say it, Satan, is not really a name. It is a description, an adversary. And so here comes Satan number one. Not in the fallen angel evil kind of sense, but in the adversary kind of sense, the Lord uh, stirred up an adversary unto Solomon. That's kind of an interesting thought right there, isn't it? Uh, that, uh, that it was actually kind of gracious of the Lord to stir up an adversary. 
uh, almost like, it doesn't really say this in the text, so it may not be true, but almost like trying to bring him back with the adversary. We probably would do well to listen to adversaries in our life every now and then. Sometimes they're just kooks and they're utterly wrong, but <laughs> we ought to uh, listen to them from time to time to see what's up. But we get this uh, Hadad, the Edomite, of the king's seed in Edom. Now, you may remember that uh, uh, Edom, that's, that's, um, that's the descendants of Esau. So they were kind of cousins there. I don't know if that means, if that's what that means of the king's seed, or if this happens to be one of the wives, many wives that are out there, and there's some, you know, maybe, hey, dad is a son of uh, his, do, you know, does it mean that? It's a little hard to tell. And if you read the uh, Jewish sages on this, they, they, uh, they're all over the map on, on uh, what it'd be. And since he's not really, again, part of our story, we, will, we don't have to answer that question today. Uh, but he's an adversary, and he's, hey, dad, the Edomite. Uh, it came to pass when David was in Edom and Joab was captain of the host, uh, gone up to bury the slain after he was smitten, every male in Edom. And it, and it gives this story that Hadad uh, fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. Uh, so Hadad survived a slaughter. Hadad ends up in Egypt. And he is in exile, I guess we would say, in Egypt, and, uh, and he doesn't like Solomon. And he's stirring up things against Solomon, is what, he, what, he got, what he's got. Uh, and um, it, uh, it gives some more uh, details through there. Uh, Hadad found favor in the sight of the Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, uh, to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of uh, Ta, uh, Ta, Tapinus, the queen. Hey, Dad, going through there, we won't read uh, all of that. Uh, but basically, uh, Hey, Dad becomes uh, prominent in Egypt. And he didn't like David, and he doesn't like Solomon. By the way, I... I jumped ahead on that, saying, uh, hey, Dad, could have been Solomon's son. He couldn't have been Solomon's son because all this happened before Solomon was even alive. Uh, well, before Solomon was king, I guess you should say. Uh, and uh, so, hey, Dad is stirred up. Okay, that's adversary number one. Number two, God stirred him up. Another adversary, another Satan, and his name is Rezon, the son of Elie e Elieda, which fled from his lord Hadassar, king of Zobah. It's very meaningful to you, right? These are not verses a lot of people memorize, you know, just for memory verses to quote to themselves. <laughs> uh, he gathered men unto him and became the captain over a band. When David slew them in Zobah, they went to Damascus, dwelled therein, and reigned in Damascus. Uh, so here we've got this guy reigning in Damascus. Uh, so basically, the Lord stirred up an enemy on both sides. You got one in the south, you got one in the north. And this is all in preparation because God says, I am going to take the kingdom from you. So let's get ready to take the kingdom from you. Surround you by enemies. Put one in the south, put one in the north. And Solomon, you're going to be able to see what, what's happening. You're going to be able to see the handwriting on the wall, to use uh, another biblical illustration that doesn't belong here. But uh, you're going to be able to see uh, what's going to come. You know, it would be interesting here uh, to, to speculate. It didn't happen anyway, so it's kind of a moot point. But uh, to speculate, could Solomon have even repented at this point and come back? I don't know what you do when you have 700 wives. How do you undo that you know, and, uh, and, uh, and fix all that problem? What, could he have done anything? He didn't anyway, so, so we, don't, we don't have to, another, yet another problem we don't have to solve. But God says, this, this is done. Uh, you know, uh, I, it's just a matter of time. Here's an enemy down here. Here's another enemy down here. And that's where we start out. Uh, and uh, verse uh, 25 again, he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Sodom, uh, excuse me, of Solomon. Uh, beside the mischief that Hadad did, he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. Now that gets us then to verse 26, which is the first time in the Bible we see this guy right here, 
Jeroboam. Introducing Jeroboam. And uh, we've got um, basically uh, three, three little Satans, <laughs> to use the uh, Hebrew word. You got, uh, hey dad, you got Rizon, and now you got Jeroboam as the Satan or the adversary against Solomon. So we were introduced to Jeroboam. Again, uh, we've not seen him before. The only hint we had is, I'm going to give the kingdom to your servant. But we didn't know it was Jeroboam, and we wouldn't know that until we read the end of the story, but we've already read the end of the story. Now we know the rest of the story. Jeroboam's going to end up being the guy that takes these 10 tribes and he's going to make them a country. He's going to be the, uh, the, the first kings. But now he's just Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephratite of Zereda, Solomon's servant. Okay. Uh, not, not really much reason to go through the uh, family tree, so to speak. Uh, it's just, I don't know, I guess it's kind of uh, interesting. You know, when you, when you pick up a big tome of a biography, like the one I'm looking at on Harry S. Truman, you know, it always starts with the great-grandparents. They, you know, they left their home and covered wagon, and you know, you go through some of that. And uh, pretty much any time you open a book and it starts talking about the great-grandparents, you can know this is going to be a famous guy. <laughs> and it's kind of that way in the Bible, too. You know, it goes back and let me tell you who his dad was and all this. And so it uh, mentions that. It mentions that he is an epaph epaphrodite. Epaphrodite. It's hard to say, isn't it? Uh, I, I just want to stop there for just a moment because there are two, really, I think you could argue three usages of that word in the Bible and you might run across it and get uh, a little confused. Because Ruth the Moabitess, uh, her mother, I should say Na Naomi, the mother-in-law of Ruth the Moabitess. Remember the book of Ruth? <laughs> Naomi was from Bethlehem Epaphrata. And people around Bethlehem were called Epaphratites. That's one use, and it has nothing to do with this. Uh, Jeroboam was not from around Bethlehem. He was not that Epaphrodite. Uh, there is another use, which you could argue is maybe from all of these, and that is that the word itself basically means uh, uh, well-to-do, uh, strong leadership kind of people you would use the word Epaphrodite to describe someone like that. But I don't think that's the use it's here either. The third use is an Epaphrodite is a descendant of Ephraim, who we talked in our study of Hosea. So there are actually a few places in the, uh, in the King James Bible that it does translate this Epaphrodite as Ephraimite. And I think that is the usage that is given here, is that Jeroboam is an Ephraimite. Now, we know that he is an Ephraimite, and we know that uh, Ephraimites are called Epaphrodites. How is all that put together? I don't know that it's all that important, but the, my, the, the one thing I want to uh, point out to you is don't confuse it with the uh, Epaphrodites of Judah. He's an Epaphrodite of Ephraim. He's from the northern tribes. <laughs> And uh, that's where he comes from. And he is then a Solomon's servant. Now, again, if you're, if you're reading, if you've never read the story before and you're reading closely, you say, I'm going to take it from Solomon's servant. You say, wait, 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 I don't know who Solomon's servant is. And then you come down and uh, you see two enemies and then you see a third one, an adversary, and you say, Solomon's servant. Oh, maybe this is our guy, right? It's a little bit of a secret here, but if you are... Uh, Inspector Clouseau, then you would say, hmm, I think we should keep our eye on Jeroboam the Epaphrodite. See, it's either he or Mrs. White in the library with the wrench. <laughs> One of those. His, his mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman. And he lifted up his hand against the king. Let's go right there. Even he lifted up his hand against the king. That is, Jeroboam 
the king's servant lifted up his hand against the king. Wait a minute, I want to know more, right? Well, you're in luck, because there's another verse. Uh, it says, and this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. Well, now I understand. Of course he would lift his hand up against the king because the king built Milo and repaired the breaches. All makes perfect sense now, doesn't it? Not so much. <laughs> you know, what is it about the repairing of Milo, or excuse me, the building of Milo and repairing the breaches of the city of David? Why would your servant, the king's servant, rise up against the king because of that? Well, for that, you have to go back and you have to do a little work. And of course, the first thing that you would ask is, tell me about this Milo. I would like to know. Uh, what is it he built Milo? Sounds like a city, kind of, right? Uh, you know, he built Milo. You know, off over there, uh, lives in uh, my, like Brasilia or something like that, that you would just build this. Uh, it's not really, however, a city. When there's a couple of places that uh, you can look, and let's just uh, go ahead and uh, uh, look at uh, one of these, uh, at least one. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 9 is the first uh, time we see it. And uh, there, David, King David, dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. There you need, we almost need a map, and I should have brought you one, but uh, let's say this is the temple. How's that? Downhill from the temple is David's palace. David's palace and the whole governmental complex, basically, is to the south, downhill from the temple. And uh, they're doing some fabulous excavations there today. You can go in, and it's uh, called the City of David. And the City of David is not all of Jerusalem, but remember, there wasn't necessarily all of Jerusalem like we would know it today, or even in New Testament times. It was kind of a small little place. I imagine Taos might be uh, quite a bit bigger than the City of David was at that point. So, so you've got... The Temple Mount, in David's day there was no temple, but there was a hill, Mount Moriah, up there that the temple is someday going to be on. Downhill to the south, David builds his palace. So if uh, David looks north, he sees a mountain out there. And it's owned by Aruna the Jebusite. Someday the temple is going to be there. Then he builds his palace, and from his palace down, as the hill goes, goes downward, he builds all of the governmental complexes and whatnot. So he's in the heights of the city, basically, and he can look down upon the city and see it all, uh, all, all there. And it uh, ends up down at the bottom, by the way. Later on, it was not built in David's day, but it ends up at the, at the Pool of Siloam is down at the bottom. So from David's palace to the Pool of Siloam, uh, kind of a, a long... Uh, I don't know, oval-shaped uh, place. He put the walls around it, and there, there it was. Now, we think that this place between David's palace and the top of the mountain where the temple is going to be, that that is called Milo. Uh, and he left Milo open. Of course, there wasn't anything up there, so it was sort of opened. We actually think it might have even at one point been that David was on the top of the mountain, and then there was a little valley, and then it went up to the higher mountain. And so there was this empty space right in here that was Milo. Uh, now, there's no empty space there today, but let's uh, see if we can figure uh, all this out. But let's get one more, while well, you got that in your mind uh, there, let's look at... Uh, uh, this, the second uh, reference to Milo, and that's in uh, 1 Kings 9, 24, in the days of Solomon. It says, But Pharaoh's daughter came up out of the city of David unto her house, which Solomon had built for her. Then did he build Milo. Ah, okay. Uh, he's now built a, 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 a place 
for his favorite foreign wife, the daughter of Pharaoh. And he, he built Milo. And Jeroboam didn't like the fact that he built Milo. We think maybe that Milo, between the city of David and the temple that's now here in Solomon's day, there was this open space or maybe even kind of a valley and a space that was, let's just call it uh, public lands, it's public lands. And you could gather there before you go into the temple. You could have a celebration. You could, uh, uh, you could camp there. You could whatever. It's, uh, it's, it makes the temple accessible. But now they come in and put a big fence around it. Uh, built Milo might even be fill in that mountain so that now we can build on top of that and uh, just go right up to it. And, and if this is the case today, certainly when you go from where we believe this, the, uh, the, the, the uh, palace of David was to the temple, there's no, there's no hole there. It's, uh, it, it's all built upon its uh, city. There's roads there and everything else. So did Solomon kind of join that together? Now let's get back to uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter uh, 11, verse 27, and it says, so he built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. Now that almost sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? To repair the breaches of the city of David. And maybe it is that way, but do you know the, uh, the King James puts a, 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 a translator's note that says closed the breaches. Instead of repaired, it's closed. Now, there are many who think this is probably the uh, the most common Jewish rabbinical understanding of this passage anyway, that close the breaches means close the gaps between the two parts of the city. You had the city over here, you had the city over here, he closed it in, he made it all one city. Jeroboam didn't like this. Jeroboam might have been a... honestly, a, a good young man who's watching out for the people. And now you've got, hey, our temple is up there. Here's the palace. We can't get through. We can't get up. We can't go anywhere. You closed it all off. You've made all this yours. And this upsets him. And especially probably upset him because the whole Pharaoh's daughter thing was played a big part in this, that, you know, we need her to have a nice house and a big uh, backyard with a nice view. And Jeroboam's sort of looking out uh, for the people here on it. And so it was this cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Now, th that's, uh, the, the, the problem with the interpretation is that it's been 3,000 years and we lost the newspapers. Uh, you know, we, we don't know exactly what's going on here. And there's several scenarios you could put together, but it... It, it, it seems to be something like this, that Solomon's building programs are going beyond anything that's good for the people. He now, it, it, it seems to be a very self-serving thing by the king, and uh, to the people he says, let them eat cake. You know, I'm not, I don't care about that. And so Jeroboam rises as, as the people's candidate, if you will, and he's uh, for the people, he's a commoner, he's one of them, and uh, he, he rises up and, and goes up against the king. And the and, and reason I put uh, Jeroboam in a pretty good light is because from here on for quite a while, Jeroboam's going to be in a pretty good light in the Bible. The Bible seems to uh, to say, in, well, earlier it said of those two, and it included really three of them here, uh, of uh, Jeroboam, that the Lord stirred up this adversary. The Lord kind of wants him to rise up against. This is a part of it. And so he's, uh, he's doing, doing this, whatever it is. How, you know, if, if, if the story I said is not quite right, it's something like that. It's something that still has the same themes to it. Probably if we could actually pick up the newspaper and say, oh, that's how it happened. It would be a little different, but you would still say, ah, okay, still the same reason. <laughs> same reason for rising up here. So it uh, goes on then in verse 28, and it gets a little bit confusing because I think verse 28 backs up and tells you 
a little bit more because I think the story is kind of like, I need to tell you about Jeroboam, the adversary. He rose up against the king because of Milo and he repaired the breaches. Oh, you don't know who Jeroboam is, do you? Well, let me back up and tell you. And, it, and sort of, so he's kind of uh, doing that. And so he says in verse 28, uh, the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. That's a pretty good way to be introduced in the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> he is a mighty, he's not just Solomon's servant, which I suppose is good enough, but he is a mighty man of valor. Uh, that phrase is only used four times, one uh, in the Bible. One is obviously Jeroboam, uh, and uh, Gideon is the, uh, the, the other one that you would probably have some recognition of the name. There's four altogether. One of them is David's, one of David's mighty men, uh, and then another guy that, you know, Jephthah, one of the judges of Israel that's not very well known. Uh, so the Bible doesn't just sprinkle out mighty man of valor all over the place. So here's Jeroboam introduced as he's a mighty man of valor. In addition to that, it kind of tells how he came into his position. Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious. We'll stop right there. He's not only a mighty man of valor, but he is industrious. Now, industrious is actually how he got hired in the first place, I think. So, verse 28 is foundational for verses 26 and 27. If you need to, switch the order and go 28, 26, 27, uh, just to, uh, to put that, because I think we've got a little bit of flashback, because you're saying, oh, he rose up against the king, he's the king's servant. Well, where did this guy come from? You know, what's he? Well, he's a mighty man of valor, but even before that, Solomon just looked out and said, there's an industrious young man. And... Uh, uh, you know, I believe, and you probably do too, and certainly anybody who's ever hired people, if you see an industrious young man, hire him. <laughs> Don't ask questions, hire him. You need him. <laughs> you get him. And that seems to be what Solomon, in perhaps days of wisdom, uh, did, said, here's a guy who gets up out of bed in the morning, and he goes to work, and he does stuff, and, uh, you know, I'm going to take this guy, and uh, he hires him. So that... Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, if you're a young man. That's uh, what, what what better <laughs> what better um, uh, description could you have than mighty man of valor and industrious? Uh, that's about as good as you're going to get in a description of some stranger in the Bible like this. Uh, so he's a mighty man of valor. He is industrious, and so Solomon made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Now, what is the house of Joseph? You remember the tribe of Joseph, don't you? Two tribes, you got it. You're right. Manasseh and Ephraim. That's right. Uh, so, these two tribes were, that was the two children of Joseph. There is no tribe of Joseph, but Joseph gets kind of a double blessing in that both of his children will become a tribe. And that's uh, how you make the tribes. Sometimes we say the half tribe, uh, but you only end up with 11 if you count them as half. <laughs> you know? So uh, it's, uh, they're a whole tribe. Uh, and uh, so you end up with uh, uh, these two tribes that he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Okay. That means he's got a political position. It's an appointed political position, but he's got a political position. He's got some notoriety. He's got some ability to, to influence. He's a mighty man of valor. He's industrious. That's, that's enough to get where people are going to know and recognize you. Probably to put more to this story and uh, finish it up here, I suspect that Jeroboam, one of the things he's probably upset with when Solomon is now building Milo and fixing the breaches or whatever he's doing there, I suspect it cost money. And by this time in Solomon's reign, he was taxing the people to death. And Jeroboam's the guy that has to go out there and face him. Not King Solomon, who, you know, just makes the edict. Jeroboam's got to go and say, okay, you, you know, I need, I need your, your, your portion. I need you to pay up. And uh, so he probably is then the one saying, 
look what you're making me do. You're, you're, I'm having already to tax and tax and tax my people who are, uh, you know, can't even put food on the table because of you. And now you build this palace for your strange woman? <laughs> and no, I'm not doing this. And he rose up against the king. So I think what we've got to start out with is this is a uh, kid with a backbone. And uh, he's got a good head on his shoulders. And uh, he's industrious. He's a mighty man of valor. He uh, is willing even to speak up against the king. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, even if the king is not you know, in the ancient realm of kings where they could just chop off your head and be done with you. Uh, you know, even if the king is just the boss or, you know, whatever it is, to, to go up against someone with authority, when you're a person of respect, especially, uh, and, you, and, you, and you understand authority and you respect authority, to go up against that authority when something is wrong, that's not an easy thing to do. So that's the introduction of Jeroboam. And at this point, I would have to say, as uh, we are uh, thinking of... Uh, Jeroboam, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I would say, well, so far, everything seems good to me. As a matter of fact, I would say, oh, Lord, send us a Jeroboam. <laughs> we could use someone who would, uh, you know, be a mighty man of valor and industrious and recognize, ah, something's got to change. I'm going to go up against the king. The problem is this story doesn't end as well as it starts. Stay tuned. <laughs> we shall pick up. But next week's going to be good. Next week where he's going to uh, meet a prophet of God that you may not have heard of much, Abijah, Ahijah, excuse me. Uh, and uh, that prophet is going to uh, give some predictions that uh, relate to Jeroboam. And uh, we'll see how it lays out from there on our series of Jeroboam, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Too bad we can't just pause and keep Jeroboam like he is right there. If we could have done that, we would have paused with Solomon and kept him while he was a good, wise uh, man too. But uh, anyway, uh, this, is, this is one of the cases, uh, it's a, maybe one of the few in the Bible, where it's the young men who are the good men and the old men who are the bad men. By the time Jeroboam gets old, he's going to be a bad guy. By the time uh, Solomon gets old, he's a bad guy. Uh, but the young men got it together in this case. Uh, and... Uh, uh, there it goes. You know, by the way, this is totally free. Look at the ages sometimes of the uh, men who signed the Declaration of Independence. They were like kids, <laughs> you know, mostly in their 30s. Some of them, I think one was in his 20s. You got a few 40s and 50s, uh, but they were not very old uh, and uh, willing to uh, go up against the king. And then some of them got old and didn't turn out so good, but <laughs> um, let me lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thanks for your scripture and for the uh, uh, very interesting story that uh, we get in history that is uh, given. And no doubt, uh, as uh, tonight, all the way through, there will be some uh, things that are just uh, uh, mirrors of life because nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said, uh, things... Uh, just uh, as much as they change, uh, we find they're just the same as they always have been. And uh, we are uh, grateful for the opportunity to, to uh, study it and to learn this little portion of Scripture in First Kings that uh, likely we haven't studied much before, but we will in these few weeks. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. We'll see you uh, Sunday for Capernaum Part 2 in our tour of Israel at 945 and then another uh, new look at an old story, 10. 45. You're dismissed.